Um, tonight, we are talking about implementing Act 171, um, or using land use planning to address forest fragmentation. You'll hear during the next hour and a half um, quite a bit of information about this act and the role of land use planning to address it. Um, we have a panel of presenters, including myself, Monica Prisper-Hart from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. We also have Claire Rock from Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission and Jamie Fidel from the Vermont Natural Resources Council. So welcome everybody. Thanks, Monica. So we're going to just an outline of the presentation that we're going to walk you through. We're going to start with a brief introduction to planning provisions in Act 171 and what you need to do in order to comply with the new planning requirements, including assessment and mapping, community input and values, goals and policies, integrating into your future land use plan, and then implementation steps that you may consider. And at the end, we'll sweep with some resources that are available to help you. Okay, so the planning provisions of Act 171, and just before we walk through these, just to let you know, Act 171 was passed a, a couple of years ago by the Vermont legislature and signed into law by Governor Shumlin. And it was a forest omnibus bill. It, it, it included a number of forest related policies. And we're going to walk you through those that relate to, to land use planning. And so the new requirement to the, stand, to the state's land use planning goals is to manage Vermont's forest lands so as to maintain and improve forest blocks and habitat connectors. And Act 171 requires town and regional plans to indicate those areas that are important or require special consideration as forest blocks and habitat connectors, and then the plan for development in those areas to minimize forest fragmentation and promote the health viability and ecological function of forests. There were a couple of other clarifying provisions in Act 171 beyond those, those planning requirements. And one that we wanted to point out to you is that um, the Act clarifies that a municipal by bylaw may not regulate forestry operations. This was a bit of a, a, of a gray area in the law, and so now it's actually codified. And here you can see the definition of what a forestry operation is and what it includes. And really the idea is that it's the state that oversees and, and regulates forestry or silviculture. It's towns that can oversee uh, land clearing that's related to development. But if it's uh, forestry, then that's under the purview of the state. Okay, so in regards to the state planning goals, um, these guide the local planning process and related policies in addition to the, um, to the regional and state planning efforts. Um, and so essentially we've already uh, highlighted for you um, this relevant and new language, but this is just to, to show you where it's embedded in state statute under 24 VSA section 4302, and that is the, the new uh, goal here. So in regards to municipal plans, uh, for those municipalities that choose to plan, Chapter 117 requires that the plan includes 12 elements, many related to natural resources. And now for municipal plans that are adopted after January 1 of 2018, they must now include a map that identifies forest blocks and, and habitat connectors. And so um, the language that you should uh, be aware of is that a land use plan uh, shall consist of a map and a statement of present and prospective land uses that, and here under A, you can see what is the existing language and then what's in bold is the new language that's been added. And that's now that the map shall um, uh, basically outline the present and prospective land uses for the maintenance of forest blocks, wildlife habitat, and habitat connectors. And then to indicate those areas that are important as forest blocks and habitat connectors, and plan for development in those areas to minimize forest fragmentation, promote the health viability and ecological functions of forests. And the, the statute clarifies that a plan may include specific policies to encourage the active management of those areas for wildlife habitat, water quality, timber production, recreation, or other values or functions identified by the municipality. Okay, so that's, that's a may there. So a plan may include policies related to these or others. And then in regards to regional plans, you'll see very similar uh, language here, um, the same now for the regional planning requirements. Um, and uh, 
essentially, um, we're just highlighting here again where this is embedded in Statute 24 VSA Section 4348. And in regards to the regional plans, um, they should take into consideration um, the same language which we just showed you before. Okay, there were also some definitions that were included in the statute, being that we're now looking at planning for forest blocks and habitat connectors. Those are defined. The forest block here, you can see the definition. Um, and it's important to note that the legislature uh, intentionally wanted to recognize that a forest block may include recreational trails, wetlands, or other natural features that do not them, themselves possess tree cover. Um, and also um, uses exempt from regulation under that, this, this section. Um, and so um, really the idea was that recreational trails would be compatible with the, with the forest blocks that towns choose to identify. Um, and then since the goal is to minimize the fragmentation of these forest blocks or fragmentation of connectors that are identified, uh, there is a definition here for forest fragmentation. And again, it's uh, the division or conversion of a block by land development other than recreational um, trails. And so again, they wanted to show that the idea is that recreation is compatible in these areas that are identified. That's one of the values that these forest blocks provide. Okay, you can see the definition here for habitat connector as well. And uh, just to point out that some towns already through their planning may refer to habitat, habitat connectors as wildlife corridors. That's a term that's commonly used and legislature recognized that um, you can use that term in, in lieu of habitat connector. Okay, and then here, when they were talking about recreational trails being compatible in forest blocks, um, they just provided a definition here that it's um, a trail that's not paved and, and used um, for these uh, recreational uses or other similar recreational activities. Okay, just wanted to quickly point out that there is a guidance document that has been developed by the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, when Act 171 was signed into law, in June of 2016 by Governor Shumlin, he directed the Agency of Natural Resources to publish guidance in order to help with the implementation of these planning directives and specifically to, revi to revise um, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development's planning manual to include more direction. And here we've provided you the link to the guidance. The guidance is still in draft form, uh, but it should be finalized uh, very shortly and you are able to access it now in, in draft form. Um, so I want to make that available to you. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Claire. Great, thanks, Jamie. So as part of this webinar, we're going to uh, basically lay out a suggested or recommended steps um, that you can go through in your community to help you address the provisions of Act 171. Um, the diagram that you're seeing here basically is a um, overall planning process. You are probably doing this already in your local communities, and um, this is actually from the ACCD planning manual. So um, what we're going to do this evening is we're going to go through um, steps one through five. And as I mentioned, this is probably something that you're already doing in your communities. And this is a recommended approach to um, help you as you're working towards addressing these new planning provisions. So I'm actually going to hand it back over to Monica here, and she's going to take it from here, and she'll start talking about step one, undertaking that community assessment. Great, thank you, Claire. Just getting my screen up here. And here we go. So um, what this is really all about is a celebration of our Vermont forests. And the first part of this community assessment is to figure out, well, what role do forests play in your community? As the legislature decided to enact um, this legislation, they were really thinking about the benefits, the many benefits of large forest blocks. And these include, among many others, biological diversity. Um, we love our forests for scenery. They provide clean air and clean water. Um, they provide working lands for the forest industry. They provide many economic benefits, especially from recreation and tourism. And I'll get into those a little bit more in a minute. Um, they prevent erosion and reduce flooding. Um, they provide land for hunting, fishing, wildlife viewing, 
it, we, there have been studies that show that um, large forests transmit fewer tick-borne illnesses, so they're good for our health. They sequester carbon and absorb harmful gases, which is, of course, important in this age of climate change. Um, and many of those things on that last page um, are part of our economy as well. We really need forests to be part of our Vermont economy. The forest recreation and tourism industry provides um, nearly $2 billion to Vermont every year. Um, the forest products industry adds another billion and a half dollars. And together, those two industries create 12% of Vermont's GDP, um, or 20,000 jobs. So this is really no laughing matter. Um, Vermont's forests are really part of life in Vermont. And as the legislature moved this act forward, they were really thinking about um, our working landscape and this, the, our forests that are, that are used for recreation. And they're thinking about how these forests are essential for so many aspects of our, um, of our, our lives here in Vermont. Um, and what they're really pushing for is looking at forests holistically, um, looking at them as working forests, and also trying to see how we can manage for the ecologically functional landscape. Um, it's really about this recognition that the health of our forests is essential for the health of our economy and the health of our community. These things, these three pieces are very closely linked together. Um, and so by addressing our forests, we can also address the other pieces. Now, in looking at our forest health, um, there's one piece that they were looking at in particular, and it's a pattern that has been happening over the last several decades in Vermont. Um, we're losing wildlife habitat and we're losing working forest. And this is what that loss looks like. I'm going to show you a series of images um, of aerial photos over the next few minutes. Um, they happen to be of a, a location in Stowe, um, but the same pattern is happening in many communities throughout Vermont. We're, we'll start in 1962, and I'm going to, to change the color of that picture. Um, the green on all of these photos shows the biggest or most intact pieces of forest that can be used as wildlife habitat or working forests. And I'd like you to just watch how this changes over time. Before we, we move through though, I'd like you to think about how these forests connect together. There's a big block of forest right in the center of the screen. Um, but then if you move north, if you imagine a, an animal moving through from one habitat type to another across that forest, they can move pretty easily from that big block in the middle up north, or they could cross a, a, the road, that's Route 100, fairly easily to get to the forest blocks on the other side of the road to the west. Um, so these forests are not only large, but they're connected. Now watch what happens over time. Here's 1962, 1974. 1980, 1996, 2007, and 2011. Now, as you can see, those, those forests have changed substantially. There were, there were a lot of developments that happened starting from the road and working out or outward, um, some driveways that, that formed one at a time and then more houses um, along the side of, the, of those roads. And what I'd like you to really look at here is the pattern of those forests. Now, some things, you can see that there are trees on the screen that are not colored in green. Um, that's because when those forests, those very small blocks of forest are totally surrounded by roads and development, they're not really useful either as wildlife habitat um, or as working forests anymore. So they've been taken out. But you can also see this pattern where an animal walking from the western side of the screen into that big block and then up to the north would have a much harder time. Now, what I didn't tell you at the beginning is that the amount of green colored in um, from the beginning to the end of these slides is really pretty much the same from the beginning to the end. Um, while there were farm fields that grew up into forest over time, um, we didn't really lose trees over that amount of time. What we lost is the pattern those continuous blocks of forest um, and those connections between them. The pattern has changed, but really not the amount of forest. Those houses and roads don't each take up a lot of room. They just change the pattern. Now, that's important because what we know from this study that I'll share with you from Maine and other studies is that there are many more species of wildlife present in a large undeveloped block of forest than in smaller blocks. Um, the lists on the screen show 
what happens when you take an undeveloped block of land and the species that it contains and you break it up into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller chunks. Um, fewer species are, are likely to occur in each block of forest. Um, so all else being equal, a larger block of forest is going to have more species diversity than a smaller block of forest. Now, what does that actually look like in the Vermont landscape? Um, we can use this, this same region up near Stowe um, as an example. Now, we have lots of forest left in Vermont, and some of those forests are in very large blocks. And this is great for, for species diversity. Those large forest blocks, as I mentioned, will have the most species diversity in them. Um, but then we can start to break that down and think about how those species are moving from those big blocks, um, from one big block to another across the landscape, um, in, through these areas that are a little bit more fragmented. Now, we might start by picturing big animals like this that, that maintain large home ranges, like a black bear that might cover 30 or more square miles, um, or a river otter that covers 15 to 30 linear miles of river, a moose, a bobcat, these are all animals that cover wide home ranges um, in their daily or monthly or yearly searches um, for food or to connect with mates. Um, and while these large blocks of forest are important for many species and are, are host to, to more diversity, um, it sometimes helps to imagine these animals moving through the landscape um, because if they have what they need, then a lot of these other animals and other species um, will be able to live on the landscapes too. So taking this area, um, let's break it down into those forest blocks. Where are those forest blocks? In this case, there's a very large forest block, a 72,000 acre forest block um, that's home to many species. And next to that is another large block. This one's 32,000 acres. And if wildlife can move between these, there's a road between them, but if species can cross that road, um, then really they can they can live as if they're they're on a 104 acre, 104,000 acre block, um, which is terrific, wonderful wildlife habitat. Now, what about across that valley? Here's another large block of habitat that's home to a host of, of species. But here's the thing, are these connected or are these two separate blocks with completely different species? Are our species able to cross back and forth or are they completely separate? And what happens with all of those smaller blocks of habitat in between? Are wildlife able to get across? That's really the big question. We can zoom in and see a landscape like this. Um, there's a lot going on. There's some forests, there's some water, there's some roads, there's some houses, there's some farm fields. Um, and much of the Vermont landscape would look something like this. We can start to pick out, well, here are the places where there's perhaps the biggest or uh, most intact forest blocks. But then if we think about how wildlife are moving through that screen, where are they going? They're going to be relying on some of these smaller blocks of habitat in between. That might not be um, the biggest and best forest, but if wildlife can pass through there, um, then they can connect those larger blocks of habitat as well. They also might rely on these, these smaller, even smaller blocks of forest um, that might not really be considered forests at all, um, but if they make paths for wildlife to travel through, then they're certainly a, a, an important part of the equation. And sometimes um, wildlife would also travel along stream um, segments, so the, the vegetation near waterways, and that can be an important part of the landscape as well. And these would all be considered those habitat connectors that the legislation is talking about. We can zoom in even further and think about, well, what animals are actually moving through the landscape and what do they need? And of course, it depends on what species. Um, but here in the picture, um, this, this is taken from a study done here in Vermont in the Champlain Valley of how bobcats move through the landscape. Um, and a number of, bo of bobcats were given radio collars, GPS collars. And um, the data that we got back are shown by these yellow dots on the map. These are all locations where this bobcat traveled um, near Shelburne Pond. And you can see that most of the time, the bobcat was found in the forests or in these wetland habitats. That's where most of those yellow dots are. But sometimes it ventured out of that habitat to connect to the forest on the other side. 
And as it did so, it used this veg this row of vegetation, a very thin row of vegetation, but a, a row of vegetation um, to, to travel between farm fields, um, to cross the road where he, this bobcat could get a, across. Um, it's the shortest distance that they could that they could travel while still staying under vegetation. Um, and so for some species, including bobcats, um, even a hedgerow can be an important part of this whole picture of connectivity. Yes, so you said this word connectivity, and this is what we're referring to as connectivity. It's taking, um, if, you, if you take a landscape like the one on the left, where you have little patches of forest habitat, but they're not connected together, then every time they're not connected, it's a barrier for animals to move around. Um, if instead we have a, a scenario like the like like on the right, where um, the vegetation is all connected, then wildlife can travel um, up and down it. Plants, animals, many species can use these to move around. Now, if we zoom out, we can think of the same patterns at a regional scale, um, looking across Vermont, for example, where we have pathways where wildlife are most likely to travel um, throughout the state. And those are, are shown here in the brown color, the darker brown, are those main pathways where our wildlife are most likely to, to connect. Um, and you can see that they, they form these patterns up and down the Green Mountains, um, from the Green Mountains west over to the Adirondacks, um, from the Green Mountains up to the Northeast Kingdom, and a few other um, pathways throughout the state. And then we can actually zoom out even farther and see that Vermont um, and the wildlife travel patterns in Vermont are really part of something even bigger. Um, throughout the Northeast of the United States and up into Canada, um, the map here shows um, where wildlife Right now, wildlife are, are able to travel pretty well throughout that whole region that's covered in blue. Um, and that is what maintains these really healthy wildlife populations that the northeast of the United States is, is known for, as well as the southeastern corner of Canada. Um, but that whole network of wildlife um, is based on the areas that are colored in purple and orange and green and other colors. Um, where, where those pathways rely on some very narrow corridors in some places. Um, and you can see that in this network of wildlife traveling through the Northeast, Vermont is really at the crossroads of how wildlife gets through here. So all scales matter. I've just kind of zoomed in from um, that single bobcat using this, this thin row of vegetation between farm fields um, through the state of Vermont and then throughout um, the Northeast and, and even into Canada. And really all of these scales matter. Um, that bobcat using that single hedgerow, that hedgerow is an important piece of this entire network um, that actually extends throughout the Northeast. They all matter. Those large scales rely on the small ones. Now, in terms of Act 171 and towns and regions needing to, um, to plan for where these, these areas are, um, where wildlife are most likely to be, where those blocks of forest are, and where the habitat connectors are. Um, what the legislation says is that you need to identify these places within the town. Um, and you can do this with the help of BioFinder, which is a mapping resource available at the state. And the next part of this webinar is going to, to walk through some of the data sources that you can use to find these places in the local context. We'll start with a map called forest blocks, or we call them habitat blocks, um, because really a lot of these blocks include things like wetlands um, that are not your classic um, example of forest, even if they might have some vegetation. They're areas of natural cover and um, as they're mapped, they, they don't show roads or development. They're surrounded by roads and development. But these blocks themselves um, contain no roads or development. Um, and we've mapped all of those blocks in Vermont that are at least 20 acres of forest, where the smallest blocks are shown in yellow. And as the colors get darker, those blocks get larger. Um, as you zoom into a specific location, and we'll be showing a lot of the Mad River Valley, and in particular Waitsfield, um, over the next little bit, um, you can start to see, well, where are the biggest blocks of habitat at the town level? 
Um, in this map, you can see that that block way up at the top, um, the, the northernmost block and the one at the, at the south, um, are the biggest blocks in the area. Um, the one at the northern side of the screen is, is what's attached to the camel's hump area. Um, and it's a big block of forest. And then you can also see those smaller blocks of forest um, in yellow. Now, of course, size is not the only thing that's important. Um, and so you can, you can start with this kind of map, looking at forest or habitat blocks. Um, but if you need some guidance of, well, what's big enough to really be considered important, um, we have some guidance in a different layer that's called interior forest. And throughout the state of Vermont, interior forest blocks have been mapped. Those are, they're taking the same data, those habitat blocks from the last one, um, but it's breaking it up into across the entire state of Vermont, which ones are the highest priority? Um, do, they, do they provide um, the functions of the largest or most intact, most ecologically significant um, blocks of interior forest? And, and so those are shown in um, the highest priority ones are in dark red and the other ones are in pink. And once again, we can zoom into a particular area like Waitsfield and see that um, in the Mad River Valley, there are some highest priority interior forests along this line of the Green Mountains. Um, and then in the eastern side of Waitsfield and that area, um, there is still there's some, some forests that are still highly important, um, but they don't carry quite the same level of importance, again, if you're examining them at the state level. Now we can also look at something else that's called connectivity blocks. Um, this is the same brown map that I was showing you earlier that shows the pathways of how wildlife are most likely to connect um, throughout the entire state. And once again, those have been mapped as highest priority or priority. And some of these, as you can imagine, are the same things, the same blocks um, that are, are important as interior forest, but some of them are not. Um, some some of these are, are likely to include much smaller blocks of forest as well. Um, and here, zooming into the same location in the Mad River Valley, you can see that on the western side of the Mad River Valley, it covers pretty much the same territory as those important forest blocks that are important just as forest. Um, but this also places very high importance on the eastern side of the Mad River Valley, um, the eastern side of Waitsfield, for example, where well, it's not the, the best quality or the largest block of forest in the, at the state level. It's extremely important for these wildlife movement patterns. Um, and in Waitsfield, this is, the, this is a place that we'll be coming back to later in this webinar, um, thinking about how wildlife move across this area. Now, if you combine these two together, the interior forest and connectivity blocks, um, then you might, you might see a pattern that looks like this, where we have those highest priority interior forests in the red, um, but then you can also see how they connect together. Um, and, and as Waitsfield, or a town such as Waitsfield, um, is trying to decide what's most important, um, which blocks are most important at their level, then they might look at this priority level, um, which is slightly less important at the state level, um, than those darker shades of, of red and brown. Um, and they might need to decide, do they want to include those um, or not as important forest blocks? And they can use other, other factors um, of what's important in their town to help them decide. But in the end, what you're going to want to come up with is a map of what you at the town level decide to include um, as, as the most important forest or habitat blocks in your area. And Waitsfield might decide something like this um, and just take those highest uh, priority um, forest blocks, or they might include those, those other ones, those priority ones as well. Um, that's, a, that's a choice that, that the town will need to wrestle with. Now, it's not just about those large blocks of forest, it's also about the habitat connectors. Um, so this next part will have slightly different layers um, and we'll go through and, and find how you how do you de determine these habitat connectors? Because of course, in the, the Mad River Valley, um, if you see those just those large blocks of forest, um, you see that large open space in between um, the, the area on the right and the area on the left. Um, and you might wonder, well, what's in there? And of course, the main thing that, that connects them is the Mad River. Um, and, and wildlife 
often, often travel along the, the vegetated sides of waterways. And so probably the most important um, wildlife connector, habitat connector, is going to be looking at where the, the waters are. Um, and there's a, there's a layer that you can find on BioFinder that's called the highest priority surface water and riparian areas that really maps not just where the water goes, um, but where the vegetation um, can remain along the side of that waterway um, to help wildlife and, um, it, it, well, it does many things. It would help um, wildlife move through an area and it of course also protects water quality and it protects against erosion and other factors. We can um, add this to BioFinder and look at, at those, um, if we look at the, the, the forest blocks and add this as a habitat connector and add it to our map. And then the other thing to include in a place like Waitsfield would be wildlife road crossings. Where are wildlife actually most likely to cross roads? And we have this available as a data layer as well, um, where you can see where the habitat exists um, for wildlife to be most likely to cross roads. Um, to, to establish their network. Now, in some cases, in, in a place like Waitsfield, um, we've really covered most of the, the, of the primary forest blocks um, that you're probably going to include in a map. Although these maps that I'm showing of Waitsfield, these are not maps that Waitsfield has created. I'm just using them as an example. Um, but in a place like Ferrisburg, which is in the Champlain Valley, um, you might also have, as a habitat connector, some smaller forest blocks. Um, you can see in this picture, the dark red is the, the biggest forest blocks. Um, the dark brown is an important habitat connector, um, co connectivity block. But there's also all these smaller blocks of forest. And in a place like Ferrisburg, it can be really challenging to figure out um, that whole network of what forest blocks um, to include in a map like this. Um, now, remember that these habitat connectors in a place like Ferrisburg in particular, where there aren't a lot of forests, can be just as important as identifying the forest blocks. Um, when we're looking for connectivity, um, it's really looking at how this whole network connects and the water in some places might be just as important as the forest. Going back to Wastefield, it's also okay to simplify these maps um, by the time you put something in your town plan. For example, we simplified the, um, the forest blocks, those big blocks, into the green layer that you see in back. Um, but these connectors can also best be simplified. So instead of showing all of those wildlife road crossings, for example, um, you, can, you can look at some of those in the, the center part of Waitsfield and think, well, in terms of connecting those forests that we were trying to connect in the beginning, those, this, this network that we identified as the most important, um, some of those road crossings are going to be much more important than others. And so it's okay to select some of those, um, those ones that keep the, the forest intact. Or you might even choose um, to show how those connections work um, through a series of arrows like this. Now, of course, you couldn't, you couldn't use this map and translate it directly into regulations for your town, but it certainly does a good job of showing what has to remain um, open and how wildlife are likely to move through the area. So using these layers um, is, is a good way to start. Um, there's another series of, uh, there's another set of maps that's also available in BioFinder that can give you a different framework. Um, and it's called Vermont Conservation Design. Um, Vermont Conservation Design was a map set up to look at um, to look at the landscape um, at, of, of the state of Vermont um, and, and divide pretty much the whole state into highest priority and priority ecological places. We're looking at ecological function um, in, in deciding what was highest priority and priority. Um, it looks at the ability of plants and animals to interact as they need to in order to thrive, reproduce, migrate, and move, even as the climate changes. And so the entire state of Vermont has been assigned a priority ranking um, when looking at all ecological function together. Now, if you look at this map, um, this already includes not only the places that we included as the forest blocks, but also those habitat connectors. It includes the water web network as well as the forest blocks. Um, and the advantage of this is that 
it can help connect the other natural resources um, in with those forest blocks that we've been looking at. It's really looking at, at, at all ecological priorities holistically as one. Um, and so it might be a good place to start as well. Um, it already basically connects some of these areas that we were looking at earlier, um, connecting the forests on the eastern side of Wakesfield to the forests on the western side um, through these river networks. The one thing to add to that map would be wildlife road crossings, um, where you can once again look through and, and decide which of these wildlife road crossings are most likely to contribute to that overall pattern um, of wildlife moving through forests. The same thing applies in a place like Ferrisburg, where the landscape is much more open, um, especially this makes sense, where the network of highest priority um, landscape scale Vermont conservation design um, really shows that entire network that, that, um, that is used by all natural resources. These are really the landscapes that are most likely to protect um, the important places in Vermont that include perhaps more um, than just the forest network. Now I'm going to say that this is a little bit better perhaps. It's not necessarily better in all places, um, but what is better about using a map like this is that it encompasses um, more than just the forests and the connections between them. It really looks at, um, at the entire landscape and tries to set this in the bigger picture. Um, what's better about a map like this is that it connects to other natural resources and it's not going to set forests in, in a different category than the other things that you're planning for in your town plans, for example. But perhaps the best way um, to include data in maps like this is to use some local data as well. Um, the Mad River Valley Planning District in um, a dozen years ago or so um, looked at, uh, they did a natural resources inventory um, by Arrowwood Environmental. And, and an in inventory like this, of course, costs some money, so it's, it doesn't come free. Um, but this has the advantage of giving them some very local data. And, and so they don't only have to rely on the state resources. Um, all of their data is field checked and it's really specific to their area. And it allowed them to come up with a map like this, um, which they called the tiered ecological priorities maps, um, which using their local data, they could identify some areas that were highly sensitive and they wanted to make sure these were areas that they, um, that they, they could, they, they didn't want anything to happen to these areas. Um, so those primary conservation areas are in red. Um, and as the colors get lighter, they decided, well, these are a little bit more flexible um, in terms of what happens there in the future. Um, and you'll notice that in this map, some areas were picked up that weren't identified um, at the state level by those state level resources, but this local data um, was responsible for, for picking it up um, and adding it to the list. Now, what would make this really the best um, map of all is if you could take this local data and these specific resources that were identified and then mix it back in um, with, uh, with something like Vermont Conservation Design that identifies those whole networks um, so, that, so that those highest priority wildlife road crossings, for example, might be elevated to a different standard, um, but using the local data mixed with looking at those, those region-wide networks would really be the best way to make a map like this. Now it's important too, um, to think about how the community um, is going to react to these maps um, and make sure that, that what you're mapping makes sense for your community. Um, and one way to do that is, is to do a community values mapping session. Community values mapping is where at a community forum, participants in a community are asked, well, what do you love about this area? And um, participants can, can circle places that are important as scenic views or for ecological reasons or places where they go hiking or hunting or fishing or other forms of recreation. And the value of this is that it puts these values, these human values on a map that we can compare with, um, with the ecological values. What you see in this map is it's something of a heat map where the places with the most different kinds of views, so places that were important as working forests and um, recreational areas and for wildlife habitat um, appear in the, in the red colors 
and those places that were identified as as values as a community but didn't have so many different reasons for for being valued are, are shown in green um and so it can really it can really focus on a map um the the hot spots of where people in the community really value the resources um, it can show places where um, if you combine this with an ecological inventory like what was done in the mad river valley can show you places where the ecological values and the community values match up so shown on this map in the mad river valley is um, all of the colored regions were places that were identified um, as 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 high ecological priorities and then that heat map where the highest priority values by the community are shown in that um, in the color so the the dark the, the reddish ones are where the there were the most community values shown and you can see that that same arc that we've been looking at um, covering the north part of Waitsfield and then the eastern edge um, is shown as as a really high community value as well um, the community values in the southwestern part of the town might elevate the importance um, of some of those other forest blocks that were priorities but perhaps not pr highest priorities on um, the eco on the ecological maps and so Waitsfield can use this information to inform what they do um, with their maps as they're looking at forest blocks and habitat connectors. Now the, the main thing though is to really take it back out a step and think about um, how these healthy forests in a community are part of a healthy economy and healthy community because of course the reason we're doing this is is to um, maintain the health of the forests so that it maintains the health of of the communities that we love now for more information or if you have questions about how to do this mapping per part in particular um, i welcome you to contact me um, my email is up here. I also share a couple resources. Conserving Vermont's Natural Heritage, the book on the right, um, is a publication by Vermont Fish and Wildlife that explains a lot of the background information, the background data behind um, these map layers. And it also provides some ideas for planning um, with these re resources in mind. Um, what you see on the left, Mapping Vermont's Natural Heritage, is an upcoming publication. Um, it's finished, and we're hoping to, to get it out to the communities in the next maybe six months or so um, and it really goes through the mapping process and it explains the maps that you can find on biofinder and it also includes a process um, that you might go through for um, for doing planning with these resources so with that i'm going to give the floor over to jamie once again let's see here All right, and there you go, Jamie. Great, thanks, Monica. So Monica just helped um, us all kind of see what the options are for developing maps and the options that, that go into that, um, and also how to potentially overlap that with a shared community vision where there are some community values. And I just want to reiterate that, as I mentioned before, there is the guidance that is available, which touches on a lot of the steps that Monica walked through and our other resources that she she outlined as well as I'd like to reiterate that in order for the mapping really to utilize the Fish and Wildlife Department um, to help in, in creating the maps. Um, so now what we'd like to do is walk you through okay what do you do with the maps and if you've identified the community values as well and gone through some kind of community vision um, where you've really helped to prioritize the areas that you'd like to identify for this planning um, now what do you do? The next step is to update and include this information in the natural resources map for the town and region. Okay, and so what we've talked about before is the fact that you have a land use map, which we're going to get to. But um, for many um, regional or town plans, there's also um, a natural resources map where you're you're outlining and mapping all the natural resource values and. We believe it's important that if you've gone through this mapping process for these forest blocks and habitat connectors to add that to your, your natural resources map. Um, and then once the map is updated, complete an overall assessment. Um, and so this is kind of your assessment phase of, of your planning process. And that would look at analyzing the conditions and the opportunities and threats affecting identified forest blocks and habitat connectors, 
then update the natural resource and or land use chapters of your plan with some text or some language regarding the condition of the forest, the benefits that they provide, and, um, and the threats that are facing these areas. This is um, similar to other planning that you may do for other natural resources, and we're just suggesting that you go through that planning process that is outlined in the ACCD manual. Okay, so then the next step is to identify goals and policies. The, um, and Vermont State uh, land use goals provide a good starting point for, for thinking about um, this step. Sorry about that. So um, I highlighted before the overall state goal that's been added here. Um, that forest land should be managed so as to maintain and improve forest blocks and habitat connectors. And so a community, your community or your region can opt to use this same language um, as a goal for either in the plan um, or a regional plan. Um, and so just wanted to let you know that you can use this existing language. But as a first step, review your existing plan goals and assess how well they're addressing this state planning goal. Um, and you may already have goals that exist that relate to forest or wildlife. And so you may want to look at those and uh, they may relate to minimize, minimizing forest fragmentation or maintaining habitat connectivity already. So do a quick assessment. Is your goal already adequate or do you need to refine it so as to, to meet the intent here of this new, new overall planning state land use goal? as a second step, either update the existing goals or write new goals that help achieve the purpose, as I just mentioned. And here are just some quick examples of goals that you could consider implementing in regards to meeting the intent of Act 171, uh, simply to maintain and improve the ecological integrity of intact forest blocks or to maintain and improve forest blocks that are large enough to support viable working forests, or maintain and improve the ecological integrity and functionality of habitat connectors. So this is offered in the guidance and, um, or you could craft your own. Okay, so really, as I was just saying, each community can select the policies that reflect their own specific natural resource um, and community values. And here's just a couple quick examples. Um, so one community in regards to their policies may focus on landowner incentives. The town will support landowners working to reduce fragmentation of important forest blocks through programs such as enrollment in the current use program or through conservation efforts such as conservation easements or other efforts a landowner may undertake. Other policies may focus on how land development actually takes place on the land. So here's an example from Montgomery that already exists. Development shall be designed and cited in a manner to limit the fragmentation of large blocks of contiguous forest to the greatest degree possible. And then you can see here, um, an existing policy at the regional uh, commission level um, to design and site in a manner to preserve contiguous areas of active or potential wildlife habitat, um, and then to try and minimize fragmentation. So there's good examples that already exist, and you could look to um, what the, the guidance that I mentioned before offers as far as other um, samples that were taken from across the state. And then the guidance um, also articulates some sample policies that don't come from a specific municipality, but these have been crafted as options for you to consider and tailor um, based on trying to either minimize the encroachment of development or impacts into interior forest blocks um, and habitat connectors. And that could be by trying to take a proactive approach on a development pattern that actually takes place in those forest blocks or trying to limit the extent of degree to which um, roads may actually penetrate into the heart of a, of a forest block or into a habitat connector. Um, so really you can, you, you can tailor this in a lot of different ways, but um, there is sample language for you to consider. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Claire. Okay, hey. great. Thank you, Jamie. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about how you take that information and kind of integrate it into 
uh, your town plan and into that future land use plan. Um, once again, we're using this recommended approach uh, that is included within the ACCD planning manual. Um, and uh, Monica has gone through step one and step two, and Jamie spoke about step three. And so kind of looking about how that actually might play out in your town plan, we have this example of Waitsfield. Um, so as you can see, what's included here is one of, one of Waitsfield's natural resource maps. Um, you can see they've identified a, ver a variety of different uh, resources, and along with that um, natural resource map that shows some of their um, their forest areas and habitat areas. They've included um, information um, that describes those areas, and then they include um, some goals and policies that speak directly to those different resources. So for example, in Waitsfield, they've included a goal which identifies that one of their goals is um, the responsible stewardship and sustainable use of Waitsfield's natural resources. Uh, they go on to identify some policies where they're stating that what they want to do is to be able to identify and protect important natural resources that include those forest resources and those significant habitats. Some of their policies also go on to identify that they want to um, prioritize some of the areas for open space protection. So they've identified that land above 1,500 feet in the Northfield Range, which is, the, um, uh, which is on the... Um, east side of town, they want to protect the high elevation land um, in that section of town. And they've also identified that they want to um, uh, prioritize significant wildlife habitat and travel corridors uh, for their in their open space protection planning. So from there, I think it's important to note that we've talked a lot about the natural resources section of a town plan. And I think we should remember that also included within statute is the and as included within section 4382, the plan for the municipality identifies that within your town plan, you have to include a land use plan, which consists of a map and a statement of present and prospective land uses. And more specifically, under Act 171, it asks that within that future or within that land use plan, that you're identifying those forest blocks and habitat connectors and that you may also include specific policies regarding uh, the protection of those resources. And so I think here it's important to note um, that that future land use plan or that land use plan, um, we're kind of using those words interchangeably, um, that is both a map and a statement of policies on existing and proposed land uses. And then the map that's included in that land use plan um, basically graphically communicates important components of a community's vision for change. And that that land use map doesn't necessarily reflect current uses, but rather it's identifying those desired uses that the community is wanting to work towards. Um, it's important to note that that map, that land use map, is not a zoning map, but it does indeed establish the basis for a zoning map and that the land use classifications included on that land use map can be broad. What's included here is a conceptual draft future land use map that was being considered by the town of Waitsfield. You can see that they've identified areas uh, for different uses, and those areas can be broad, and they don't have to be as specific as that zoning map. And so as you're going through this process, are recommending that you you, know, you review that natural resources map um, or your 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 um, series of natural resources map, including those ones uh, that include those forest block areas. You look at what your future, your existing land uses are. You look at what your zoning says, and you also look at what your vision is for your community into the future, and what the goals are that you've identified, um, not only for other areas of town, but also what your specific goals are for protecting. Uh, natural resources and forest blocks and wildlife habitats. And as always, um, I think it's uh, understood and recognized that part of this planning process is that recognition that as a local community, you're having to strike the balance between future growth and resource protection. So one thing you may want to take a look at is maybe your plan already includes some kind of land use area, such as a conservation district, a natural resource area, or a forest reserve. And that might be a great place to start, to see how 
um, potentially those existing land use designations uh, may or may not align with some of these uh, newly or recently identified forest block areas. So if we were to look uh, um, again at Waitsfield as, as an example, and I'm sure there are many other good examples out there. Um, if we look at their natural resource map um, on the left and we look at their future land use map on the right, uh, you can see they have some similar characteristics, but they are different maps. You can see how they've taken that forested area that runs on um, the east side of town, and that translates into that forest reserve area um, in green. And so just want to recognize that through this process, there's going to be a variety of different elements that are going to contribute how you take your inventory map and you turn it into or translate it onto your uh, future land use map. And so there's going to be um, a process of uh, you know, both kind of political and um, uh, public input, which is going to help shape um, that creation of that land use map. Um, I also wanted to note that during this, um, uh, during your planning for these resources, this presents a great opportunity to work closely with your conservation commission. Um, uh, it's a great opportunity to establish that partnership or strengthen that partnership between the various boards and committees that may have a lot of this knowledge um, uh, within them and an opportunity to uh, share the work of um, planning for the community. So if we were to look a little bit more deeply at um, the Waysfield example, within their future land use plan, they have specified or identified a forest reserve district. Um, within that district, they've identified that that district is defined as all the lands with an elevation of 1,500 feet and above. So they've taken that forested area and they've had to make a decision on how they're going to create a boundary around that. So they've chosen that elevation line to determine that forest um, reserve area. Uh, they've identified that that forest reserve district includes large tracts of productive forest um, that is based upon or according to the Vermont Biodiversity Project, uh, which includes extensive areas of wildlife habitat. So as mentioned before, Here's a community where they've had some of that local information, that local inventory, and they're using that to help inform what um, their plan is for the future of their town. So the Waitsfield plan also goes and talks about um, the uh, compatible uses that would be allowed within that forest reserve area, and that, is, that information is also included on the screen. They've identified that um, within the forest reserve district that um, in order to limit the adverse impacts of additional residential development, uh, the upgrade of roads and subdivisions of large forest parcels should be discouraged. So they're really uh, being able to identify what types of uses are compatible within that district to ensure that that district ultimately does um, serve the purpose or the goal that they intended it to serve. So if we were to think about potentially um, how could a community start uh, depicting some of this information? Or if we were to take the Waitsfield example and say, you know, based on what we understand about the forest, is there a way that it could be modified or changed um, or added upon? Um, as Monica identified, um, in Waitsfield, there is the large forest block um, that if you're looking at the map on the left side, that's depicted in the orange color. And we understand that there is wildlife uh, traveling up and down that Northfield range. And that's how it fits in that regional connectivity. These forests and these animals are um, not confined within the municipal boundary. And I think it's good to look beyond the municipal boundary to think about how wildlife is moving um, not only within town, but also through town and how it's part of that bigger um, uh, connection. Um, so if we were to look at the Waitsfield example again, you know, we're looking at is there an opportunity not only to um, uh, re preserve some of that big forest tract land on, on the Worcester range on the right hand side, but how potentially could that be connected to that larger forest block that's um, up into the northwest towards Faston, and could that potentially be graphically represented on a land use map where there's an indication of some kind of arrow, some kind of movement. Maybe that's the addition of a habitat connectivity overlay, um, similar to how towns are using a flood hazard overlay. 
Uh, so we're kind of posing these questions to communities and um, putting out their ideas about how to maybe represent these different concepts on these maps. Um, and so there are just some thoughts uh, for your consideration. So the next step in the planning process is once you've identified um, what your goals are, what your strategies are, you've identified um, what your future vision for the town is in your land use map, um, the next step in the process, which is really uh, uh, important, is that implementation aspect of your town plan. Um, and basically that's kind of bringing together what we've kind of identified as step five is kind of identifying your priority action items and putting that into some kind of implementation plan. Uh, the example that you see on the screen here is actually a page out of the Heinsberg Town Plan. And you can see what they've done is they've taken their, um, their goals and strategies throughout their plan and they've put it into this matrix and it can really serve as a, um, a road map to really be that reference point for them to um, be able to just quickly look at, okay, what is our goal, what is our action, who is going to do it. So here you can see um, in the Heinsberg Town Plan, under their goals, they've identified goal 5.11. They want to protect or provide connectivity among natural areas and core wildlife habitat. And highlighted there um, under the actions is that they state that when reviewing new development, they want to strongly discourage development in key corridors or linkage areas. They go on to identify that the Development Review Board, or the DRB, is going to be the um, lead town board that's going to take on the responsibility for ensuring that action that's going to work towards that goal is actually going to be implemented. I actually heard from Jens a couple of weeks ago that he was out meeting with Heinsberg to actually help them specifically with that action item. Another way you can do this is, um, this is another example from the ACCD planning manual, and their implementation plan has been structured a little bit differently. They've actually structured their implementation plan around different sections or different elements of their town plan. The example that is showing here is that they've identified an implementation strategy that is directly related to the land use section of their town plan. So for example, the first action or strategy that they've identified is they want to be holding public meetings on land conservation options and follow up with individual meetings with key landowners. They've identified that that action should specifically be taking place in the area identified as the agricultural and conservation districts and that the Conservation Commission and assistance with the Land Trust are the most appropriate designated um, partner to ensure that that action um, is implemented. So I'm going to hand it back over to Jamie and he's going to talk a little bit more about implementation. Great, thanks Claire. Okay, so Claire gave a good introduction to this concept, the final step of, of actually outlining your implementation plan. And um, the one thing I really want to preface is that it's up to each town or region to decide what kind of action steps are, are suitable. Um, and so it could be non-regulatory, entirely non-regulatory strategies. Um, they could be regulatory actions that relate to more of how to um, influence or be proactive about the development patterns that take place, or they could be a combination of the two. Um, but it's really, again, it's, it's up to each town or region to decide what is the appropriate um, strategy or set of strategies. And there's nothing in Act 171 that requires a town to take a regulatory approach over a non-regulatory approach. Um, but again, be sure to identify who will carry out each action step and how and when it will be implemented. So just to give you a flavor of just some options that are available, and then I will uh, highlight a, a, a resource, a book that's, that goes into depth on all of these options. So for example, on the non-regulatory side of things, if a town wants to look at options of engaging with landowners and doing it through um, education or promotion of certain types of conservation-related programs, there's uh, potentially enrolling in Vermont's current use program, um, which lowers the property taxes for landowners who do not develop on their land and maintain it as productive forest land. 
Um, you can encourage landowners in forest blocks or in these habitat connectors to have a management or a conservation plan, working with either a professional forester or a biologist to help identify um, how, to, how to take good management approaches uh, to, to owning and managing the land. Or a town or region could provide workshops for landowners to learn about conservation easements, which is a, a tool that sterilizes the development rights on the property. Um, it's entirely a voluntary mechanism for landowners who want to conserve their property, and then they can enjoy certain tax benefits that go along with putting a conservation easement on the property, which are outlined here. Another option is to establish a town forest and use it as an opportunity to showcase model sustainable forest management or to allow for recreation or to protect forest values such as watershed protection, um, wildlife habitat, and um, there's at least 121 town forests in Vermont covering 120,000 acres and sometimes they are funded through a conservation fund that's implemented at the local level and that's another uh, non-regulatory option that's available to towns. And then there's a host of policies that towns may want to consider uh, that would support the forest products industry, um, like encouraging landowners to enroll in the current use program where they are required to have a management plan and do some, some timber harvesting um, in order to enjoy the reduced property tax rates that come with the program. Or if you switch over to the regulatory side, how to actually review subdivisions so that the lots are created that still allow for access to do timber management. And then there's options such as engaging landowners to help them think about what's the long-term strategy for their land. What happens when a landowner passes on? Is there any kind of strategy in place to guide who the future owners will be so that the land just isn't necessarily subdivided and, and distributed evenly to each child, but maybe there's a more um, planned out approach to who will own the land and what are some ideas for keeping that land intact based on many of the programs that we just mentioned. Okay, and then if a town is interested in taking um, more of a regulatory approach than to guide how development occurs in forest blocks or habitat connectors, um, as Claire mentioned before, and as many of you are familiar with, there are di um, different kinds of, of district, zoning districts, that can get at the, the conservation themes which we've been talking about through this webinar. So different options are forest districts, which often emphasize productive working forests. Uh, conservation districts, which may have a primary focus of uh, meeting conservation values, and that could also include um, working forests and other ecological protections, watershed protection, or an overlay district. So it's not a static district, but it's one that um, can pick up um, different locations in the town of where you may have habitat, for example. So you could have a wildlife uh, habitat connector overlay district. And then there's the option of incorporating development review standards and zoning bylaws to address forest and wildlife resources. So looking at either site review standards that apply to the site layout and design uh, for the development of a particular property or conditional use standards that uh, evaluate certain uses which have been determined that need an additional level of review. So you can write in uh, standards that would minimize fragmentation through the site review or through conditional use uh, review. And then there's other options such as creating or updating subdivision regulations to address forest fragmentation. 50% of, of towns, municipalities have subdivision regulations. Uh, for those towns that do, they could add a standard to minimize forest fragmentation. Um, there's also the option of encouraging planned unit developments to um, create incentives to actually cluster development and then allow um, the developer of a property to actually have um, more units than may be allowed through the zoning if they've looked at clustered and certain open space protections. Also look at um, the maximum lot sizes that may be created in certain districts. If you're in a rural area and you have large lot sizes that are trying to um, actually reduce um, or maintain those areas, you may wanna um, try and understand are those lot sizes actually leading to a fragmenting result? And then maybe you wanna have some standards if you do have large lot sizes to minimize the fragmentation um, as those large lots are created or look at um, other alternatives to deal with appropriate lot sizes to minimize fragmentation. And then you could look at reviewing or strengthening local road policies uh, to re reduce forest fragmentation and there's a lot of options there. Um, so we don't have time to go into all of the regulatory and non-regulatory options. 
but as uh, once you have made your, your list or your, your chart and you've gone through uh, your prioritization, um, taking you know to consideration some of these um, some of these thoughts here. Does it help the forest blocks and habitat connectors to maintain them? Does it align with your community values? Um, you have um, capacity. What will be the cost? Are there financial resources to implement that strategy or action step? Is there staff or volunteer capacity to do the work? What's the timing? As Claire mentioned before, and are there opportunities to build off existing efforts or minimal? already underway in the town or perhaps adjoining and partnering with, with um, other towns in the area. So as I mentioned earlier, there was a book uh, which does outline in depth the regulatory and the non-regulatory strategies that are available for you to consider as action steps. Um, this really helps you walk through if you're actually on the implementation side, but you could also use it as a, as a menu. And it, this is a publication that we put together at Vermont Natural Resources Council. It is available. Uh, online at this this link. Again, this PowerPoint presentation will be available to you, so you don't have to uh, get the the exact email or um, web addresses that we're offering tonight. You can go back to the to this uh, presentation. Okay, so we've now brought you first full circle through this planning process, a planning process that already the towns and regions are encouraged to to implement um, through the ACCD planning manual, but we've uh, we've, we've attempted to walk you through it in the context of these new Act 171 requirements. And so um, just briefly before we break um, and take your questions, we just wanted to outline some next steps and resources that are available to you. Um, as we've already mentioned, BioFinder and the Department of Fish and Wildlife are available. To, um, Fish and Wildlife Department is available to help you utilize and understand how to, um, BioFinder can help you the identification of the resources which we've been talking about. Um, Monica mentioned that there's an upcoming mapping Vermont Natural Heritage book coming out soon. There is the a &R guidance, which is essentially was created to help you through this planning process, which we've just outlined, that is available in draft, draft format, as we already mentioned. And then there is the already the existing planning manual, the ACCD planning manual. Of course, utilize your Vermont Regional Planning Commissions um, they can help you with uh, technical assistance and implementation. Um, as I already just mentioned, our VNRC community strategies for Vermont's forests and wildlife will help you with menu of action steps or implementation steps you can take. There is an ongoing project right now that is funded um, from a grant from the Forest Service that will be looking at creating some, um, integrating all this information into one web page, which will be available um, within a couple of years. And then obviously, we all want to hear from you as you're doing your planning and looking at your implementation to understand what your questions are and how we can help. And so here is our contact information. With that, I believe we'd like to entertain any questions that you may have. Great, Jamie. Um, we've received some questions. Two of them were regarding uh, sort of the presentation in general, including the, the presentation slides. So uh, I, think, I think I've answered those. Of course, the presentation and the webinar will be available, made available a couple days from now. Um, but some of the other questions uh, I can just go ahead and read out. The first one was, is there a definition for paved from Irene? And I think, um, I think that means like a like a paved, like what a what constitutes a paved surface. I guess was that question in regards to when we were looking at the definition for recreational trails. I this was, was in the paved. beginning. Yeah, I, I believe so. I don't know if that's actually defined in statute, um, and I don't know if um, Claire is a planner. If you. Um, any of the regions, if there are standard definitions of what uh, a paved versus unpaved trail would be. I guess it's, uh, I know, I recall when the legislature was working through the recreational trail definition, it was, I think they were thinking, you know, a hard surface versus one that is, um, um, would not be of, of a pavement or a permanent hard surface. Great. The next question um, was from CJ. He asks, uh, or they ask, what constitutes a break in the blocks? Or um, is there a distance 
Um, I imagine this refers to the habitat blocks or any of the um, or any of those blocks, including connectivity blocks or the interior forest blocks. Um, they are they really um, let me think. <laughs> um, I think I believe those um, those that you'll find online um, are buffered slightly and I would I will need to look up how much they are buffered, but I can get back to you on that if you sent me an email. Um, essentially, it looks at there's a buffer of development around roadways and structures. Um, those habitat blocks do not, um, a, a, they would not have a break for a class four road, um, but other roads would be, would exclude, would be excluded from those blocks. Great, thanks. Irene asked if a town is trying to determine the relative importance of forest blocks for forestry operations rather than for wildlife habitat value, is there a different layer, I assume in BioFinder, that should be used? I guess my answer to that would be um, that for maintaining forest Three operations, um, though it's really easiest to maintain forestry on larger forest blocks as well. Um, I think I would use the same the same blocks. Um, the connectivity ones might be a little bit less important through that lens of looking at the forest products industry. Um, you really might want to look more at that first layer I showed um, that was the habitat blocks that were separated out by size um, instead of the ones that were prioritized. Um, and that really will tell you what the biggest blocks of forest are um, that include anything over 20 acres in a town. Um, and so you can, it, it, size would be the only factor to look at there. But um, if you assume that the bigger forest blocks um, are more likely to be used for forestry, then you could use that data layer. I guess I would quickly add that I'm not aware of there being a statewide kind of forest soils productivity map although the Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation may be able to help as far as any gas layers that are available that can highlight where there are really kind of productive um, forest lands from a forestry perspective. And then certainly I think, you know, utilizing uh, local knowledge as far as where, where there are areas that have traditionally been important, that may be longstanding areas that are dedicated for, for forestry. Um, talking with with local people who are engaged um, in in the forest products industry or in processing um, or talking to the county forester to to glean some information about where are um, where are the the large productive forest lands that are important for forestry yeah I totally to add to that I think there is um there is a uh, process you can go through to identify where those productive forest lands are. I think it's the FLISA. Is that, I'm not sure if that's familiar to folks. Um, uh, so that's a process you could go through to identify where those forest blocks are. And then I just wanted to kind of, uh, or productive forest land. And then I wanted to speak a little bit to, I think, um, Irene's question about the, the trails, um, which I think is an interesting one as far as the, the surface you know, what, what is the surface area? Um, and, and maybe Monica could speak a little bit more to that when thinking about kind of what kind of surface, um, thinking about kind of like uh, wildlife connectivity and what surface um, is kind of more easily crossed or traveled <laughs> by animals. But I don't know, Monica, if you could speak a little bit more to how like a, a, tra a trail data layer is used. And um, I, my understanding is that it's it's more important about the the width of the trail as far as the opening in the forest, uh, maybe? Uh, Monica, I don't think, I'm not sure if you have anything to add yeah, to that. Yeah, um, so in terms of recreation, I, I would say, so So the main goal of looking at, at the, the layers that we were just looking at, I mean, that primary thing is keeping forest blocks as large as possible. And within those larger forest blocks, um, most types of recreation are quite compatible with most species of wildlife. Now, when you get down to the site specific layer, um, that might not include all trail types in all locations. 
Um, and there are, of course, different trail types that are going to impact different locations differently. Like in a wetland, you would, of course, want a different trail um, than in a forest. And on a higher, a steeper slope, you're going to have, you're going to want a different kind of trail than on a flat surface. Um, and so when we start getting into those real, real specifics in terms of, of um, wildlife or the ecological impact of a trail, um, I'm afraid there's no specific definition that is going to make a trail, um, you know, a, a good trail versus a bad trail or one that impacts wildlife or, or ecological habitat more than another because it really, it really depends on the, on the location. Um, I am afraid that might not be a satisfying answer, but <laughs> um, in, in general, those trails that, um, that provide the, the least impact would be best. Um, but at the scale that we're looking at um, of connecting forest flocks to one another, really most recreation is going to be um, a compatible use at that scale. I would just quickly add, and I think, you know, Monica was giving you an example of, of some of our understanding based on the ecological side of, of um, potential impacts of trails to certain types of wildlife. For the planning process, as outlined in Act 171, um, just, to, just to reorient everybody, what the legislature was saying is that for the towns that are going to identify important forest blocks or habitat connectors, that those areas could be compatible with recreational trails. And they decided to make a distinction by saying that if you have an unpaved trail, Go ahead and identify that area as being important that that was part of the recognized value of the area having said that there may be an area that a town or a region has where you actually have a paved trail that happens to go through an important forest area and you want to identify that area as being important um, for some kind of conservation value you can you can go ahead and do all the planning that's necessary to meet the town or region's goals for that area especially if it's conservation related and so while it may not meet necessarily definition that they had under Act 171, um, there's still plenty of authority, existing authority now for you to go ahead and do the necessary type of planning, identifying that area. So I think the idea here is that you shouldn't let a trail preclude any one area if you think it's important um, for your planning consideration. It's just a question of whether you're going to identify it as a forest block for Act 171 purposes or not. Okay, in the same vein, we have a, a question from JP. Uh, part of this is a comment and rather long, but uh, essentially they ask why are recreational trails exempted? There are some perceived or documented risks from say mountain bike trails and perhaps uh, backcountry ski glade trails just wondering why why the recreational ones are are exempted I, I could take a first shot at that and anybody else uh, jump in I think the idea was that the legislature recognized that these forest blocks have values for multiple purposes and they heard from the recreational community um, that these areas are important to them for recreation and so the legislature wanted to acknowledge that as towns or regions go forward with their planning, that they don't preclude areas that may have recreation um, within them for this planning process. And this planning process is to really look at, um, it was minimizing the fragmentation from the kind of development and they, they did not want to go so far as to then, I guess, get into the minutia of, of each kind of recreational opportunity and the degree it could or couldn't fragment. They wanted to just say, no, there's value to these areas for, for, um, for recreation. I think if a town or individuals in the town um, then do want to look at or examine the actual impacts of one recreational activity um, over another, um, certainly there's, you know, the broad ability to do that, that kind of research and, and bring it to inform the overall planning. But just for Act 171 purposes, the legislature um, uh, decided that they wanted to go ahead and support uh, recreational values in these areas for, for the planning that goes into this process. Great. Another question from Harris, who's, who, uh, who says, uh, 
I understand that municipalities cannot write ordinances related to forest management or silviculture, since that is a purview of the state, but if a property is being subdivided and de developed and is subject to an agreement or sketch plan review, can the municipality regulate forest management or silviculture as a part of the conditions? If so, how does this differ from, I suppose, ordinances that are normally a purview of the state? My understanding is that a town can regulate land clearing that's related to a subdivision. So it's for clearing for a lot, uh, for a house or for, for infrastructure. If the question is getting out once then the subdivision has been laid out, can the town through an ordinance regulate the forestry or silviculture that occurs on the rest of the forest land? My understanding is no, that's in the state's purview. If it's land clearing related to development or infrastructure, yes, that's fully within the authority of the town. Right, I would just follow up and say I can uh, agree with what Jamie said, and I'd, I'd also say that, um, uh, uh, that it might be under the town's jurisdiction to determine if that is um, if that forestry practice is indeed a a bona fide forestry practice as identified under the agriculture the Department of Agriculture um, because if it's if it's not um, then it may well be something that could be related by the town if it doesn't meet the Department of Agriculture's uh, definition of a forestry activity. Cool. I would, I would actually look at the, the statute itself to see how they define. I, I, I showed you the language before, but look at the forestry operation uh, definition, because that's what will guide you as far as whether the activity is a um, considered forestry or not. But I think what Claire was getting at is that actually, you know, if, if you're doing, if you're calling it forestry, but you're really clearing where the, where the roads are going to go and the houses are going to go, then the town could potentially step in and say that that was not, that was not actually forestry. That was just a, a step, a precursor to development, which you tried to call forestry. And that's where, and that's where there, um, you know, um, there could be some, some implications Cool. There's a question from Emily. Must town forests be managed for timber with a forest management plan? And is there any funding available for town forest acquisition? I would um, suggest that, uh, is it Emily that asked the question? Um, reach out to um, Kate Fourier, uh, who is with the Urban and Key community forestry program that was in the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Um, she is a great resource uh, that would be able to uh, talk with you more specifically about um, resources that are, are available for uh, town forest. There is, there, are, there are some federal funding programs that do fund town forest creation. There is a community open space and forest program um, that's available and um, Towns are not required if they have a town forest to, to have forestry. Uh, many towns do allow firewood processing or forestry according to a forest management plan, but I do not believe it's a it's a requirement. It's up to the town to decide what the what the right management uh, emphases are for that. But if there's federal funding, sometimes there are certain requirements attached to it. Claire, could you perhaps spell Kate Fourier's uh, name in the chat? That might be useful. Yeah. Cool. And that's all the questions that I had. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jenny, for orchestrating this. And thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. Um, please do feel free to contact us if you come up with additional questions after this. And again, uh, we'll be making the webinar public or putting it on our YouTube channel in a couple days along with the presentation. So thank you all for attending and have a good night.
Good night. Thank you. <laughs>